All right. What time is it? It's a little after 6.30 in the morning. Three hours before the open of trading on Wall Street. Welcome to Quant Box Live, where we get our global macro on and uncover the best fundamental opportunities. How do we do that, Wayne? Ooh, very astute question. Well, we look at things like, I don't know, the yield on the 10-year T-note. We look at gold and oil. We look at the stock market. We look at the euro dollar, which represents 40% of all Forex trading every single day, according to the Bureau of International Settlements. And the little thing called crypto, which is now apparently a real thing. Thank you to Gary Ginsler's uh, a- approval of ETFs. Um, and it only dropped 20% <laughs> in a couple of days. You're like, oh, can you imagine? Oh, holy smokes, if that happened to other assets. But anyway, so we look at all these things and we look at the long-term macroeconomics of currencies and, and other assets. And if it's a currency, well, it's a pair. So then we also have to do comparative analysis. But we do look at inflation and uh, uh, GDP growth and interest rates and the employment level. We look at the five-year average of seasonality and 20-year average of seasonality. We look at retail positioning in the asset. We look at institu- institutional positioning of the asset. We look. We do technical analysis and seven-day linear projections. And through, oh, oh my God! Yeah, but you know what? You don't have to do it. Quantbox does it for you. It automates everything. So just look at, you know. You're, you might be a retail Forex trader, but you're trying to trade more professionally, more like a billion dollar institutional investor. And so now you have an, a process, an artificial intelligence, really, like, a, like an assistant that's doing heavy lifting for you. So for many people, they either uh, adopt artificial intelligence and its automation uh, or they get left behind. So like yesterday, we had the, uh, the Fed meeting. And this is our ability to track the dot plots. You don't have to download the summary of economic projections for, you know, for the Fed. But what about the Bank of New Zealand, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, Swiss National Bank? Like you have to you have to track all their projections too. Monetary policy as far as setting interest rates as well as projected inflation, all the way out to 2026. Once again, that is literally impossible for uh, any trader, but in particular institutional, uh, or sorry, uh, retail traders. So, uh, well, Quantbox makes you, uh, well, make big trading decisions, like a big institutional trader. So anyways, uh, it's 79 bucks a month, but it comes with a trial, YouTubers. Cool. Right on. So hopefully, oops, hopefully... When you make informed business decisions and investing decisions and trading decisions, when you recognize you're on a trend, you have the confidence to let your winners run. Let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. Please stay small, stay humble, focus in the long term, never risk money you cannot afford to lose. Oh, looks like I got to get rid of that. That's uh, yesterday's uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, I thought it'd be two hours. It was two and a half hours. Sorry, I like telling stories. Let's log into the QB Pro. (laughs) How did the market react to the Fed? Well, what did Jay Powell say? Well, he said March would be, what is not premature. Mm. Anyways, he said not March. Good. Because <clears throat> Quantbox had that plotted since last November. And the rest of the world just woke up yesterday. Really? No cut in March? Quantbox knew that back in November. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Quantbox. So anywho, yields are below 4%. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that's good, yeah. So that makes me happy. Uh, Remember, uh, uh, I shorted this at 5.0. So below four is good territory again. It also shows that money is flowing into the capital markets properly. That's great. Oil trying to do a little rebound. Uh, It was at 79. uh, um, What was it, last Monday? And then anyways, collapsed. Now we're trying to get back up. Okay. Uh, Gold hasn't done really much. 
nor is it expected to. Uh, yeah, well, good. Look, the SP 500 came down today. That makes sense. And if you attended the Quant Box presentation, I explained it from three different ways mathematically why that makes sense. So the thing is, what are you going to do next? Today could still be a hedging day. Very often after a big collapse, you have a bouncy bounce. So you really, if you haven't hedged yet, today might be your decision on whether you should hedge the S&P 500 or more importantly, the NASDAQ, because it's a higher vol. And, uh, uh, and you wait, just wait and see. Now, one of the good things I like, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the good things I like is now, I was worried that the Fed would be ambiguous and then we'd all be set up for a March cut. And then they don't cut, which again, Quantbox had already <laughs> literally created charts for, um, would then freak everybody out. So like if they thought there was a good chance they would cut in March, then you'd have a false rally and all that. And then they don't cut and then it collapses. Just great small volatility. But they were transparent enough yesterday. Thank you. And that was that transparency was something I also talked about in the presentation. But nonetheless, they they were transparent enough in the Q and A. I thought the statement was dumb, but he said not March. So now we know it's not March. I mean, literally, it went from seventy percent down to thirty five percent chance, right? So we now we know it's not March. So now we can just play the normal game. We can go. Seasonality is going to be more reliable now when you do your seasonality research. So sweet, because there's no. There's no, let's say, fundamental reason to shift the seasonality profile, if you will. So good, good, good. Thank you for that transparency. Okay, yesterday there was only a cup, uh, one thing bearish, very bearish. Now there's a couple of things very bearish. But you can see these are changing. Cool. A little bit of recovery in the Japanese stock market as well. All right, so look, we... We dropped ever so slightly, ever so slightly, to negative two. Where, you know, you could you could say it's bearish. In that scenario, you sell the Aussie, you sell the Euro, you sell the CAD, you sell the Kiwi, you sell the Gold, you sell the S and P five hundred. Fine, fine, fine. And you you know consider buying Swissy, you consider buying Yen, and you consider buying dollar. Yep. But uh, it's uh, not clear across the board yet. I know you're like, but the Fed meeting, the Fed meeting, the Fed meeting. Well, look, this isn't looking at any economic data. It's only looking at the, the capital markets, the financial markets. So it's only looking at what how other traders are behaving, in particular institutional investors, because they move the markets. And it's uh, not clear across the board. Now, look, VIX went way up. Yeah, well, we, we figured that would be normal. And that's bad. S&P 500, well, still up for, for the, you know, for the last 30 days. It's still profitable. Okay, gold hasn't done much. Okay. Yen is down. Well, that's good. Okay. Yields are still up from a month ago. So yes, yields are down to in the last few days. Remember yields were at 3.65 and then they went all the way to 4.11, I think, and then come back around. So yes, they are down. Okay. They're down here on the short run, but they're up here. So you see like, okay, maybe we have a trend forming, but it hasn't formed yet. Today is going to be critical in the quant box, you know, analysis of this risk. This you would think that this should like, and I say think, uh, 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 you you would assume that because of the fundamental change yesterday, and the fundamental changes, no cuts are coming anytime soon, that this would happen. So therefore, you would assume that these would start changing, right? So the yen could get strong. You see how it says the yen could get strong? Oh, oops, I did it out of order. There. It says here yen could get strong. So if it does get strong, 
this number will go from negative three and a half to let's say above zero. And at some point this goes to negative one. Okay. S&P 500 goes negative. So we drop another 2% over the course of the next few, you know, a week or so. So let's say over the next week, we drop 2%. Well, then that would be a negative one. You see, and all of a sudden this will start rolling over if those things happened. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. It's not looking at seasonality. It's not looking at positioning. It's not looking at GDP. It's not looking at anything. It's just showing you what is actually happening in the market based on other investors making similar decisions as you. Now, they have probably have a lot more money than you, so you should probably align your objectives with their objectives. And that's what it's telling you. It's starting, but you still have time. So, for example, if my assumption was that this was going to happen, meaning more bearish tones would start to grab hold in the behavior of the market, then maybe today, so yesterday was a big down day, let's say in NASI, okay, NAS. Um, if NAS had a big down day, and I, was it 2.0? Was it two? And I think S&P was down 1.6. Uh, so if you had an update today, but you assumed this was going to rotate over the next few days as these numbers change, then today's your opportunity to short or add a short. So like I, uh, you know, like you could buy if, so if you owned the stock market already, you might, you could buy an ETF that is actually short. There are many. So if it, the ETF is short the market. So if you buy it, and the market falls, you make money. You see? So anyways, uh, I, I said Tuesday was decision day on that. Yesterday was decision day on that. And then today is still plausibly a bounce day. What they call a dead cat bounce. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyways. So you might have a lower high. Might be an opportunity. Okay. All right. So what is going on? S&P 500 bloodbath. Nazi's already rebounded. Huh. It's up a little bit. S&P 500. Niet. Dow. Niet. Nikkei. Niet. Okay. Yeah. Dax. You know, there are things in the NASDAQ that are interesting. Um, I looked at stocks that um, have been up recently, and you get your NVIDIAs and stuff. But then you want to look at things you might want to own that have fallen over the lot in January. Did you notice that Tesla's down 25%? Hmm. Yeah. Well, that shows you, like, maybe that's a good opportunity or maybe it's bad. Um, uh, when I was in Cuba with my uh, uh, with my buddy, my, I've known him for, I don't know, 40 years. Anyways, we're sitting, sitting in Cuba. Guess what? We're smoking cigars. Look, it's Cuba, right? <laughs> and uh, we were just talking about money because uh, I don't really like to talk about anything else. Um, and... Uh, He's like, I'm killing it. I'm like, what do you mean killing it? And he's like, I have everything. <laughs> I have everything in Tesla. And I'm up like 300%. I'm loving it. And he, and he just wants to talk Tesla. He knows, So he knows everything about Tesla. 
You can ask him anything. He's on. He watches all the blogs and all the YouTube videos that people do. Subscribe to everything, and he can tell. He can talk inside, outside, on top, around, upside down, through. He knows everything about Tesla, and he's put it all in Tesla. And he's like, "I'm killing it!" Puff, puff, puff. How do you think he feels uh, at the end of January? Here we are, February first, and he's down twenty five percent for the year. Now he's still up probably, you know, 250%, but you know, at some point it's too much, right? It's too much. Oof. But anyways, it's too much. The volatility to me anyways, anyway, so, uh, sorry, buddy. Tesla's down 25%. Ouch. But that is interesting. Um, all right, so uh, what do we see? Do we see any clarity? Let's remove those indices because we know that the, that's going to move based on the Fed. What else is going? Well, the things that Quantbox expects to be down are here. And the things that Quantbox expects to be up are here. So it's actually not that bad. You see? Looks like a positive integer to me. Yeah. Uh, even the yens, you know, are not so bad. So remember, Quantbox said, well, if it's risk off, the yens are likely to get strong and the dollar's likely to get strong. Okay. But okay, these ones, Quantbox expected to be up. But notice that other yens and stuff are over here. So it seems to me that over the near term, if this trend continues, these things are going to move this way. Cool. Okay. And if Swissy gets strong, Euro Swissy comes down. That weakens Euro, so Euro CAD comes down, Euro Pound comes down. If, if we roll into risk off, dollar gets strong, so euro dollar comes down. But the, you notice it's all stronger euro in the moment. The longer term trend might be down. Okay. Now, Quantbox thinks euro Kiwi should be up, and that is up. Quantbox thinks euro Aussie should be up, and that is up. So anyways, it's not that bad. Okay. USD Swiss franc is up. USD CAD is up. So yeah, so the bigger the big outlier here is maybe that one. All right, so look, it's uh, Quantbox is basically saying it's not unexpected. It's been baked into the score over time, and now we're breaking out of it potentially. We don't know because you need time, but with the change in monetary policy, and you might say, well, Wayne, there wasn't a change. It's still longer, higher for longer. Well, the change is the market's perception of monetary policy, which is fundamentally the actual thing, isn't it? It's not, it's like, it's not what you know, it's what people trade, right? So the market has changed their perception of the Fed's monetary policy. So you could argue that that's the, the key fundamental thing, and that could create a, a, a lasting change. And and quant boxes got that scored out, and we've gone from, um, a, you know, consolidation over the last two weeks to maybe a new short-term trend, based on seasonality. I want to see if the new calendar's out. And no, nope! all right, I don't want to look at that COT report. No, we'll do that. Um, we'll do that on Monday. Um, I will send you, if you have subscribed to the QuantBox AI alerts, I will manually send you the COT report. So the AI writes the stats. It looks at the COT report and writes me a report. Uh, I don't have the ability to forward it to you uh, automatically via email or text. In this case, it will always be emailed to you. I don't have it set up to do it automatically. Uh, but I will get the report and I will send it to you, if not Friday, uh, certainly on the weekend. And so you'll get a, a sense of what the, the report, I did it last week. So you should already have a sense of, of what the new AI does to write that report. So I'll get to get that to you, hopefully on Friday. 
this is my this is where you might want to spend some time a lot of central banks reporting this week so maybe some of these like uh you know we have ecb and we have bank of england right the fed's not going to update its outlook okay Um, but nonetheless, let's go all the way back to the third quarter. Quant box is saying five and a half, then five and a half in the fourth quarter. Okay, five and a half in the first quarter, and the first cut in the second quarter, June. And the world just woke up yesterday and went, dope! I guess they're, they're not going to cut till June. They're still hanging on to it. Well, maybe it's May. Maybe it's May. Um, well, anyways, I, if you attended yesterday uh, uh, the presentation, you know exactly what I think. We, we actually, you heard me debate mentally um, how it's likely to go down based on my experience, what month they would cut. And then what month they would cut. And then what month they would cut. And, of course, in between all that, what months they won't cut. So, uh, so anyways, that's there. Thing is to watch all of this as well. Okay, because this is relative. Okay, so for, for example, you know, at some point if the yen strengthens because they're not going to cut <laughs> they're actually going to raise then you might see all these things coming down but whatever uh let's do this uh let's do this um quant box obviously is telling you the past but it can't well in here we're doing statistical analysis to predict the future okay it's it, it, it's linear projections uh with some standard deviation and some other things okay great the reason i want to bring this up is first of all it's changed a little bit because of yesterday's vol you see now i looked at this yesterday during the press conference and q and a and this was the worst case scenario there was a base case scenario probably like that and a best case scenario kind of like that so things have changed because well somewhere in here and it would be this number oops uh this number here is the slope of the mean and so the slope changed yesterday but also the var the variance changed because we had a big update like this and then no variance, no variance, no variance, no variance as we consolidated, no, a little more variance and then a lot of variance, right? And now we're down here. So the variance changed. So the best case, base case and worst case scenarios also deviated from each other. So this is cool. So if you were worried or if you were thinking about buying a dip, now, I don't think I'd do it this way, but you could. Remember, this is all about your, your own decision-making process. You would look at this worst-case scenario and say, if price comes down to 4,800 on the S&P 500, you could consider buying it if you were a long-term investor. I'm not saying if you're scalping it, if you're day trading it. No, I mean if you're going to buy it and own it, be an owner. Um, that would be one price you could consider. Oh, thank you, Denise. BOE, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so this would be one price. You could also look at like monthly uh, pivots or annual pivots and just start doing your technical analysis. Remember, this isn't really technical analysis. This is more statistical analysis. Okay? It's not predicting anything. It's analyzing. There's a difference. 
Okay. If nothing changed, that's what would happen. Well, we know there's likely a change coming. So as a technician now for uh, to create an investing or trading plan, you probably want to do right and say, well, based on the current variance and such, um, consider that standard deviation. That would be one or two standard deviations from the mean. So you might want to check out that price, 4,800. And that's a big giant maybe for you. If you were... a if you wanted to buy it and hold it, you, you might want to check out monthly pivots, both the M2, but also the S2. Okay. M, M2 or M1, like the lowest low, which often creates counter trend trades, right? You might want to look at the annual pivots and say, where, where's the annual M2? And you start looking at prices. And then as a technician, you let it do whatever it's going to do. And then when it gets to these prices, then you start to look for the potential for reversal. You look for those patterns and then you make investment or trading decisions. So just for fun, why don't we do that? Just for fun. Now, because of the, the Fed meeting, everyone's watching the stock market now. So, um, so Quantbox said 4,800. which just happens to be what a monthly pivot would think too. Now, think about this. This is how I created like things like price action pivot points. Once you start to make that connection, you're like, wait, 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 wait. We looked at 30 days of, uh, of variance from a mean in the price of the S&P 500 and then using, right, standardizing those variances, we find that 4,800 is, you know, a, a standard devi deviation below the average mean, which might be a bottom. And then pivot points are doing the same thing. And you're like, wait, there's a relationship. There is a relationship. And when I made that connection, that's how I could start doing, making, let's say, some proprietary indicators. Because I'm like, wait, they're kind of doing the same thing. And it is true. It, it is true. So that's one way to say, well, that's interesting. If price comes down here and you're already a bull, you could look for a reversal here. Now, if you look at Quantbox's seasonality, a seasonality tool, you're like, that could be it, but it probably won't be. There might be one more low, but you never know. You don't know. That's the thing. You don't know the future, but you have information about the past. So you're like, well, if it came down here, technically, you know, that could be a, 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 a reversal of the downward move based. That's what that green zone means. And then you're like, okay, if it reverses, you, and now if you, it does a higher, high, higher, low, you could buy it here. Even though you think there's a pretty high probability it can make a lower low, but you don't know that might be the low in the next high it comes early this year. Okay, so you take a shot, drop a stop, protect yourself from the downside. Remember, protect your assets, CYA. And maybe it goes up. I did that uh, earlier on the NASDAQ. Remember last month I bought it at the central pivot point? I'm like, I don't like it, but it's it's a setup. And it went up for three weeks. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, so you try there, but you're also open-minded that, you know, there's still risk built into this because seasonally it could, it could go lower. So that's one way for the month. So you're like, maybe around 4,800 I buy the S&P 500. If if you're a bull on the S&P 500. By the way, I am not necessarily this month, not necessarily next month, but I do intend to buy this thing. So then you, like I said, you can switch this up and you can, let's change this and look at it on a much higher time frame. And uh, the next pivot is 4,800. Snap. Plus, here's the price action pivot points that's actually you took. I developed that from the idea that, you know, my statistical analysis 
matched up with pivot points, which are doing similar statistical analysis. And then I started to understand the relationship. And so I put that there. And so notice, just like Quantbox, it's like, hey, around 4,800 could be a bottom. The next one could be kind of out here. And it's mostly a change of time. It would be more like, okay. But, okay, so it's more of the same. My, my next point is, if it falls for, let's say, six weeks, what if this falls all the way to the next Fed meeting? Huh. Well, we got to be open minded then to hear. Huh. Oh, whoa. Well, see, if you don't know that, you can't prepare, huh? The thing is, you should know it so you can prepare. Uh, right now, it's unlikely. Um, right now, this is the most likely scenario from a bullish point of view. But what if it is this? Should you do something? If you thought that meant we could drop that far, that's your retirement account? Yeah, you should probably do something. Now, if you're trading and you're just like, it's just another trade, well, that also gets very interesting, doesn't it? That would be very important. Now, the, the tough part about trading, and this is why you really want to use fundamentals as well as technicals, and you know, Quantbox helps with that. Um, you know, being a trader, I know the psychology because we've all been through it. Where you're like, well, you don't want it to fall because you're a bull, so maybe this holds, and then maybe this holds, and then maybe this holds, and then and then you never end up doing anything. You just watch it falling and falling and falling and falling and falling. Um, I don't like thinking that way. I want to start with the worst case scenario first. Right? Because if it if it does that, there is no support. You see how I think? Now, I'm not saying the way I think is right, but it's the way I think. If it's if it goes from bullish to no longer bullish and by the way, just out of definition, <clears throat> this 100% pull uh, pullback here if that occurred that is bearish, even though there's no lower low, even though there's no lower high, that is bearish. I will have already made the decision to hedge on the next rally because I don't want to dump my retirement account and go to cash. Can't do that, so I better do something and I got to come up with a plan. One thing is to hedge by like doing a short ETF. The other thing I could do is move money out of the NASDAQ, which has a higher beta than the S&P 500, and move that cash into the Dow, which has a lower beta than the S&P 500. So I just face less volatility, less risk. Saying I'm still in the market, and it's likely to fall, just not fall as much, and then rotate back, maybe when we're down here, and then take money out of the Dow and go back to the NASDAQ. So anyways, um, these are all the critical decisions that we need to be making right now as traders, as investors. Um, today, the, the monetary policy, or yesterday, the monetary policy did change. Not the policy, but the market's perception of the policy. And that's really all we care about. Now, usually they're lined up, but they've been unusually um, wrong. And I, had, you know, on a personal note, um, I've always struggled with this, meaning wh when I was a, a newer trader, let's say for the first 10 years of my career, I looked up to all the institutional 
investors. I, I watch CNBC and Bloomberg. I'd see them on TV. They manage billions of dollars. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, um, one day I would be, I'd like to be smart like them. I'd like to know their secrets. And then it was a little bit shattering or near the end of that t first 10 years. It's kind of like meeting your childhood hero and you find out they're not that special. Right? One day you realize, wait, there's a dude inside that Mickey Mouse costume. <laughs> That's not Mickey Mouse. That guy's a fraud. That Mickey Mouse is fraud. Right? And you're like, it breaks your heart though. You meet your childhood hero and they're like, they're not that great. They're just a regular old person. Um, I looked up to these heroes, if you will, and I'm like, they're not, they don't, they, they're not that great. And it was disconcerting for me because I wanted to be, you know, and, and that was the time where I'm like, I, I, I canceled, I, I had something like 14 magazine subscriptions and stuff. And I just canceled everything. I got uh, three of them where I, I got the investor business daily, which I don't even know is around anymore. I got the wall street journal. I got the financial times newspapers and, I just stopped reading them all because I didn't like the journalism, but also I didn't like, you know, the thought process behind these heroes of mine, the, the professional institutional investors. Now I'm at a point in my career in year 20, year 22, actually, technically, um, of being a Forex trader and trading other things, of course. But I'm at this point now, and this year is really, really extreme, which shows um, this new thought process where I don't think they know what they're doing. These institutional investors <clears throat> managing billions and trillions of dollars of other people's money, like people's life savings. I look at the data like the, the FedWatch tool, right, for example, and we can see how institutional investors, what what they think interest rates will be in the future. And, you know, and, and a great example is that that Q1 outlook I did a, a few weeks ago, where for two hours, I went through all the information that Quantbox has and, and some other stuff at the Fed. And I can't find any economic data to support those investment philosophies of the huge giant institutional investors, the smart money are unbelievably wrong. And again, not my opinion versus them. I'm not being egotistical. I can't find any data to support their opinions. They're, it's just wrong. <laughs> like, and these these were my heroes, and so you now it's like not just meeting your childhood hero and finding out they're just a regular Joe, um, but you wake up in a, one day and you're like, dude, these guys are wrong, these guys are jerks, right? And it's disconcerting, but like, well, then it's up to us. <laughs> I get right back to that. Then it's up to us. We have the data. You have your life. You have your life savings. You have your children and grandchildren to take care of. You have your expenses. Um, holy smokes. And uh, we're the ones with the right data. So thank you, Quantbox. To have it visually like this is great. And I love the community that we have around it. So uh, holy smokes. So uh, my childhood heroes are dead. Huh? The dead Kennedys. <laughs> So anyways, huh? Well, so there's plan A, there's plan B. If things go sour, there's a little bit of up. There's a little bit of hop in the market still, technically. But I have decisions I need to make today to CYA, cover my assets. So peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May our profits be above average. Yes, there are upgrades coming to Quantbox, but the development is painfully slow. I keep wanting to tell you all the cool things that are happening, uh, but I can't. But good things are happening on your behalf, just so you know. Oh, 
Thank you, Denise. I will see you probably later today. Cheers.